Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, mashallah, um, I can see that majority of us or many of us start on time, unlike myself or my brother. Um, may Allah bless you guys for joining on time, joining early. Whoever joins late, um, do some istighfar. Um, you know, we have to be on time. In the kana al-mumin kitab muqoota. We gotta be on time. Unfortunately, Miftah, the Friday night live is a the timing is is, is challenging, especially post, um, you know, um, after the hundredth episode, we've just been traveling um, quite a bit. If some of you may have noticed, if you know, if you haven't noticed, that's perfectly fine. Um, so right now, actually, we're sitting in Seattle, myself and our teacher Mufti Asim Sahib, and he will be joining me as well. Um, so we're sitting in Seattle, and right now over here, it's you know, obviously, six thirty. Um, and over there, if you're in the East Coast it's um, or in the EST timing, it's 9.30. And if you're in Central, it's, uh, I believe, 8.30. So Zakhla for joining. So hence, it took us a few minutes. We're here for a program. And inshallah, we'll be able to finish the Friday Night Live and then um, go for our program. If you're joining, please say salam and let us know where you're joining from. Yusuf Khan knows the drill. He joined and he just told us where he's from. Uh, everyone else, um, you all know the drill. Sheikh Abdul likes to you know, make sure that um, no one's left unknown. Uh, he wants to make sure everyone gets a proper shout out. Uh, mashallah, Zakhla Khair for joining. Um, Allah bless you all. Inshallah. So, we have a beautiful program planned out tonight. And inshallah, like how we do in all of our Friday night lives, where we have different mashayikh and we have, you know, a munshid or a qadi who joins us. And the idea is, of course, to speak about a topic in a, in a manner where it's not overwhelming, it's not a class. But at the same time, gain enough depth about it that, inshallah, hopefully can instill some thoughts, some motivation. Um, in some form of transformation, inshallah ta'ala. So before we have Mufti Asim join us to speak about the topic, which is what is the future of Islam in the West in the sense, like what role do we have to play in doing our best to preserve the tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with? And it's going to be an enjoyable session. Um, and inshallah, hopefully everyone enjoys it. And before that, we have our brother joining from Houston, Texas. Mu'ad al-Nas. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, Habibi. Kum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, Masha, you're looking good, Habibi. How are you? Ahlam wa sheikh. Alhamdulillah, I'm good. How about you? You're wearing the Miftah burgundy. That's our burgundy color, you know. Alhamdulillah, I'm part of your team. Alhamdulillah, it looks nice, Alhamdulillah. Where is this from? Is it from Turkey? Where is it from? Turkey, Turkey. Turkey, yeah. Turkey, na'am. Alhamdulillah. How's your brother doing? Wallah, he's doing well. He's just, you know, he's joining a little late. You know, I can't say anything to him. He's older brother. Yes, but you know, course. but it is you know, but you can tell him afterwards that you know why is he late for? Um, <laughs> he's in Flint, you know, so the Flint community is keeping him busy. Masha'Allah, um, Masha'Allah. So how's everything? How's your family? How's your father? Alhamdulillah, everyone doing great. Alhamdulillah. Allah bless you, Habib. Inshallah. Zakhla Khair for joining us after a long time. It's been a long. Yeah. It's been some. It's, it's been, been long time. time. It's, it's been, been some time. time. Inshallah. Zakhla Khair, Habib. Well, yeah. Inshallah, maybe you'll be here in person soon as well. In Inshallah. November, Inshallah. Inshallah, um, I'll try my best. Inshallah. Inshallah. So, uh, I will let you, I'll let you go for now, and I'll jump off. No one wants to hear me sing. If they want to hear me sing, then they'll put their volume on zero. So they hear to listen to you. <laughs> so I'll hide, Inshallah. Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Miskufah, al-Miskufah, lamma dhakarna. Ma 
It just said your screen froze. Yeah, I stopped my cam and maybe you can just thing. maybe you can just refresh. Okay. Um inshallah, I mean I I believe Mu'adh um and his brother Ibrahim and Nas they both recite amazing poetry on the Prophet Sallam and go across the country in Canada uh, reciting and alhamdulillah. Every time he joins us, he you know softens us up, mashallah. Bismillah. There you go. It's looking you know, here now, alhamdulillah. What's next? What do you have? What's your in a second um, poem that you recite? Uh, let's continue with Burda a little bit, then we will move. If you want me to join, just let me know. I'll join too. Yalla, bismillah. Mawla ya salli wa salli. نسير نحو المدينة وفاح عطر الجنان فما ملكت جناني لأن ما كان مني قد شم ريح المدينة قد شم ريح مدينة لما دخلت المدينة فضى الغبار علينا فقلت للقلب أنشق هذا غبار المدينة هذا غبار المدينة ألفيت فيها الحنانا وذقت فيها الأمانة بلغت أسماء جوار لما دخلت المدينة لما دخلت المدينة كانت لروحي مآبا فراق عيشي وطابا صلاة ربي على من أقام صرح المدينة أقام صرح المدينة أنت فينا أنت فينا أنت فينا لا نعذب يا حبيبي وأنت فينا أنت فينا أنت فينا أنت فينا لا نعذب يا حبيبي وأنت فينا Fina. 
Thank you, Rizakallah Takbir, Allahu Akbar, for always coming and um, leaving the gathering in a way that everyone is remembering our Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through your beautiful poetry and recital of these poems. Uh, I know your video is stuck, I believe, again. Yes, yes. But it's fine, inshallah. Rizakallah Khair, Habib. Wa iyaakum, Sayyidi. Keep me in your dua. Jazakumullah Khairan. Thank you for having me. Rizakallah Khair. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. So we move forward in the program, inshallah. Uh, whenever he joins, uh, mashallah, he always leaves us um, uh, in, in um, feeling the love of the Prophet through those beautiful words where he's speaking about the blessed city and the beloved city of, of Medina, through Munawwara, uh, of what a person experiences when they enter the city, uh, the different thoughts and the emotions that they, that they, they, that they are able to experience. Um, but without any more delay, I would like to move on with the program, inshallah, to... The second part of the program, I know my brother is still joining, inshallah. Um, in the second part of the program, we have with us Mufti Asim Rashid, inshallah, joining us. And we're sitting in the same room, so I'm just going to scoot over a little bit and ask him to join us. He is our teacher and the founder of Al-Ihsan Institute in Vancouver. And inshallah, he will speak to us about what he is doing and what he is planning to do and what he, inshallah, believes and what we all believe what, what what our purpose is and what our role is in preserving the tradition in this in this in this country while we live here, inshallah. Give some space. Okay, there you go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. So um, as as everyone, hopefully everyone can see both of us, right? Um, I'm gonna try to not eat the camera. And normally I sit all the way here. My brothers always make fun of me because I'm sitting too close to the camera. So I'll sit a little back because I'm so, you're leaning. Yeah, you're leaning back. Quite a bit, um, but inshallah, the topic today is in regards to what is the future of Islam in the West and what we what our role is in preserving this and what obviously for, uh, the, the the sheikh that's sitting next to me, he has served um, extensively in different countries where he has served in Canada for decades, in Australia for five years, and in America for a few years. Now he's in America as well. So I think and he's traveled all across the world for da'wah and for learning and teaching. So we want to understand, um, A, through his experiences, what he feels like we can implement within our homes, within our cities and communities, and also um, at the level of institutions, why they're important and what role we have to play, inshallah. So would you want to just start us off, inshallah, to some extent, and we can roll from there? Inshallah. It's a very vast topic. It's... Um... It's a very vast and profound topic, and um, I think it's also a very crucial topic. Mm -hmm. It's something that we need to have more and more conversations about. When you 
start with something as broad as what needs to be done um, for society and for communities. Um, what should we be doing going forward? What are our duties and responsibilities? Um, I think it, let's try to get a little bit of perspective first. Mm. And one of the one of the best places to start is always the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it is the best place to start as a reference point for anything that um, that affects us, anything that we're thinking about mm. or planning for. So the Quran is filled with details of the lives of people who constructed societies. Often the picture we have of a prophet uh, or a Nabi is that, you know, they went to some town, some village, they, they gave them da'wah, Left. And people responded in such and such a way, and then that was the outcome, and then that's the end of the mm. story. Then like, as if they just went in, gave them da'wah, and left. Yeah, or yeah, or they were like really, really mean people, mm. and then it was just, and often, oftentimes the, um, the only thing that is brought under, under the discussion is the... Um, you know, the invitation to Tawheed mm. and Risala, mm. which is obviously the greatest cornerstone of da'wah. But if we were to look through the Quran and see what types of situations were the nations in, what types of mindset they had, mm. what their issues and problems were, and what their specific mistakes were, we'd find that there's a lot more. Mm. And um, though some things were common in the in the nations that the prophets were sent to such as um, many times it was kufr and shirk but that wasn't always the case and uh, that wasn't the whole problem mm -hmm. if we look at um, the nation of Hud the people of Ad they had a very specific set of character traits, um, overconfidence in their mm -hmm. physical strength. They thought of mm -hmm. themselves as indestructible, invincible. The Kanash Abdullah calls them macho men, macho, right? And, um, you know, so there there was this whole arrogant attitude, man ashad min mm -hmm. uh, So, Hud alayhi salam, while he was inviting them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was also working on this mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Salih alayhi salam's people, they thought they were extremely clever because of their engineering capabilities. Mm -hmm. And the attitude was that we are invincible because of these homes that we have built. Mm. Um, the nation of Shraib alayhi salam had many issues. They, their entire system of commerce and trade was corrupt. Mm. Crime was rampant. People were not safe. Mm. And so Shraib alayhi salam, while inviting them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he also was telling them that, look, uh, mm. So there was a problem of safety and security, you know, Bandits were rampant. There was corruption in the marketplace. Mm. Things were not being done fairly. So these were also problems that Prophet mm -hmm. Ali Muhammad used to address. And if you take the, the largest cross-section of prophets, like the greatest number of prophets were sent to Bani Israel. Mm -hmm. And Bani Israel were, after all, struggling people. They were the descendants of the prophets. Mm -hmm. They were the children of the prophets. And they had the largest number of Anbiya sent to them. So what was their problem? 
Uh, yes, some of them fell, in, fell into disbelief, some of them fell into shirk. But the, the bigger problem was refusal to, to listen mm. just because they felt they were smarter. Mm. They felt they were better than this. They wanted uh, an answer to, to the questions that appeased their type of logic. Mm. And um, nothing was good enough. Nothing was good enough. When they heard the revelation of the Torah, it wasn't good enough. Oh, they said, Arina Allah We need uh-huh. to see him in plain sight with the naked eye. And um, it just went on and on, questioning, second guessing, doubting and suspecting, um, and always finding a reason not to follow the instructions. And Surah Al Baqarah is, is sufficient oh. as an example mm-hmm. of this. So, When it comes to uh, what are our duties, it's always important to go back to the Quran and say, well, what duties did the Prophet ﷺ fulfill? And those stories are told to us for, 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 for this reason so that we can learn what are the foundations of a successful society? What is a successful society founded on in terms of beliefs, ethics, earning and spending, family life? Mm-hmm and um, habits, akhlaq. So that is sort of like the the big picture, Mm. bird's eye view. Then we, then we can, if we want, we can look at where is society right now? Mm. Um, it's, It's too easy to start criticizing society or start pointing out the faults or what's wrong with our world or what's wrong with our people, what's wrong with our community. It's too easy to do that. It doesn't take a lot of talent to do that. But the, the actual thinking where, where it's required is what can we do to create a shift mm. in each area? That takes talent. That takes a lot of deep thinking. It, it takes sincerity. And it takes a lot of faith in people Mm. that, no, wait a minute, you know what? We're not going to write off people. So the first thing is that we have to have a mindset that there is not just hope for people, but there is definitely a light that people are waiting to see. And once they see it, they will come running Mm. towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It takes a very strong mindset, an extremely uh, stubbornly mm. positive, mindset. positive mindset. Because if we start looking at the negative, at the negative things, there's there's so much you just get discouraged and you just want to give it all up and just go into a corner. But we're talking about responsibility, responsibility. here, right? We're not talking about who's ready to go into a corner. We're talking about what what are we supposed to do here? Mm. So look at what the Quran says about the Prophet Sallallahu work. They were clearly lost. They were clearly astray. It was a people that was, you know, openly on the wrong path. Okay. So look at what he had to work with. He had a society in which um, he wasn't just standing out in that society. He was completely isolated from that society because of his beliefs. From day one, he, he never could subscribe to the theory of multiple gods. He could never uh, relate to those things. He could never be a part of those things. Mm. And he always kept himself distant. So sometimes we we're paying too much attention to what's happening around us um, and not enough attention to what I need to be doing in this circumstance. Mm. Because one person is in fact a very large number. Mm. One is a very large number, a very powerful number when that person has Iman, when that one has Iman attached to it. It's a very powerful force. So we should not underestimate the strength of Iman. Maybe we're weak, Mm. definitely we're weak. But Iman is such a powerful thing that it will help us get through. We just have to preserve that Iman. 
yes, if we keep exposing our iman to harms and to to elements that will tamper with it, then you know, then then it's going to be a, a much different different kind of a struggle. So our first responsibility is to safeguard our iman, and our our attitude towards that is whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. This is one thing that we do not give away even an inch of. Mm. If we can start with that mindset, we can do wonderful things. But if we're if we start with a with a with a mindset where we're prepared to negotiate, how much can, should I give up? How much should I compromise? You know what? The battle is lost before it started. So these are I'm just talking about yeah, mindsets, mindsets first. Before talking for, about for the, the actual what to do. I'm talking about what type of mindset has to be created here. And when it comes to Iman. It comes to uh, the things that are cherished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a human being. You know, akhlaq, um, righteousness of character, honesty. Um, these are things that we have to really just, um, we have to agree with ourselves, with our family members, within our social groups, that these are things we're not going to give up no matter what. And if you look at it from the other perspective, why should we? Why should we give it up? Why should we? What What is the point of living in a society where you have to give away a piece of yourself every little, every every little, little while? while. Every, every time something changes, you have to give away a piece, a piece of who you are. That's not the purpose of life. That's not, that's not even what it means to live in a Western society. Mm. Because the whole... The whole idea is uh, behind freedom is freedom of beliefs and mm. freedom of religious practice, and freedom to identify with who you want who you want to identify as. Mm. So, why are we starting with a deficit mindset, <laughs> and why are we starting with a a, 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 a yeah a, a mindset of um, of inferiority? And why are we already thinking that I'm going to have to give away so much? I'm going to have to. You're not going to have to do anything. Thank you. So that mindset, if we can convey this mindset and 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 spread this, I think we have some very strong, strong. footing. We have something. That's where we start from. This is the. This has to be the starting point. Like imagine if the Prophet Wasallam was all just you know gloomy. And depressed about what his people were doing, and then that that re- that him. rendered him incapable. Like he was so sad, he was so him. overwhelmed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If that paralyzed him, that oh no, there's so much bad going on. I can't even do tawaf around the Kaaba because people are doing it without clothes on. You know, I'm 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 trying to go around the Kaaba and I'm dodging all of these idols. You know, what's the point? But it, it started out with a very broad, a very very positive and a very strong mindset mm. and um, one person at a time one person at a time we can't expect the whole world to change you know in in a flash or mm-hmm. through through one social media post or through one clip or through one speech well, or through one, speaks stuff he thinks one, the whole world's changing i don't think she sat this long on a live without being acknowledged so we have to acknowledge him please please go Bajen. ahead <laughs> <laughs> please okay okay Bajen? Whatever you know, whatever pride I had, it got crushed right now. Just listening <laughs> and and being humbled. Why? Because you had to wait. Wait, they're gonna get you. Did you think you're gonna jump on the live and right away it's gonna be game over? Like fireworks. I thought the world was waiting for me. I was gonna come save the world, and everybody's gonna listen to me and I come on and I'm listening to you guys. And I'm like just nodding my head. I'm like, okay, when they're gonna ask me to say a word? <laughs> I'm a little bit. How you been? Alhamdulillah, Mufti Sahib, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufti Sahib, I'm sorry in advance, any any informal uh, language or behavior, I apologize. Please do not take your khilafah away from me. <laughs> He's never given it to you. <laughs> <laughs> But no, Jen, you know, the, uh, Ustav, you know, he's he, he's um he's speaking about you know a very important topic for us today, right? First so of like, all, where, where are you guys? We're in Seattle, Bajen. We're in we're in the land of whatever the Seattle is known as, but a beautiful beautiful Seattle, city. The land of tech industry, Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, 
Expedia and uh and I, I, would, I would add and matching 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 huh? you know what matching means matching you know what matching is but then oh well, yeah, yeah. They, they match all, every dollar they donate to us every dollar they give yeah. it's not profit yeah. to yeah. match so, so what's behind you guys behind the curtain like that curtain looks so hideous can you move it no, uh, behind us is Bajan, the downtown the seattle Do yeah i wanted to see the i want to see the buildings can you move it like no no it's a glare we get a glare Oh, that's why you get the glare. The glare. Yeah. So you and Mufti Saab travel together to Seattle? Yes, yeah, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, Mufti Saab, were you on the same, like on next to Mufti Dohab, in the same seat next to him? He was fortunate enough not to, you know, have a sit right next to me and experience my tornado of sleeping on an airplane. So, but he just saw it from a distance. He was happy. Because if you sat with Abdul Wahab, Mufti Dohab for four hours, Mufti Saab, you would change your impression of him. He sleeps, he sleeps so like so deep, like nothing bothers him. He sits in the plane, sleeps, lands, the plane wakes up. He wakes up when the plane lands. That's it. Yeah, well, I, I would actually see that as a blessing. Yeah. I wish I could do that, to sit on a plane and just knock out. But uh, it doesn't happen most of the time. But alhamdulillah, we, I got a lot of work done. Alhamdulillah. 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 Seattle, Seattle is very fortunate to have you. People in Seattle love both of you guys. Every time we used to come to Seattle, people always ask about Mufti Asim Saab. Mufti Asim Saab used to be in Vancouver, just down the border. So you were not far from Seattle. So it's almost like you're coming to the neighboring town of your previous um, city that you served as a imam, as a leader. So people in Seattle are very fortunate. I'm sure people from Vancouver also came over to see uh, Mufti Asim. Of course, after they saw Mufti Asim, they must have shaken up Sheikh Abdul Wahab's hand too by accident. So, you know... <laughs> So I'm glad you could, the people in Seattle are very fortunate. But I, I honestly, in front of Mufti Asim Saab, I'm 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 going to keep just lighthearted because you guys are keeping it really very important. pretty heavy heavy duty very heavy duty too. Like you know, like the and it's it's talk because you guys are talking about the solutions to the complex situation. And if you start like Mufti Asim said, it's easy for people to to pick out the problems. Mm -hmm. People will say, oh, the it's family structure, the marriage structure, the the institution of parenting, the institution of, or the education, or there's there is no Islamic schools or massages don't have imam. You can make millions of reasons why Mufti Asim Sa hit, hit it on the nail, uh, hit the nail on the head, where he says the iman, build the basic foundation of the public, make sure not compromising our iman. But overall, Mufti Asim Sa, you know, you, mashallah, you travel so much, and we're fortunate you're our teacher. You're a mentor, and also now you're you're in teaching in Michigan with with, and you're helping so many students. Well, this time, like, you know, it's gonna take. It took. It's gonna take time. People are the problem with people is we're very hasty, you know. Mm -hmm. And right when we start something, people want to say, "Why are people changing?" We start something. Why are people accepting? We start something. Why why aren't they coming? And so that aspect of how. Change comes gradual that that the region with this up. If you can explain a little bit of that, because from the prophetic way, like you know, if you if you analyze the Prophet Sirah, Sallallahu Umar bin Khattab was number sixty something, you know, that uh, in the Muslims from the men, and and if you look at the fifty of Hijrah, you know, we had 60, 70 people who migrated to Habasha. So you didn't have over hundred Muslims living in Mecca in the first five, six years, males. There must have been a lot of women, alhamdulillah. So you had 100, 150 people accept Islam. Six years, this is the slow growth, right? Now you will go anywhere in the world, you'll find a Muslim, mashallah. One point some billion Muslims. People, Islam is one of the most fast, the fastest growing religion. But how did it all begin? And how consistent in, you know, Ya yu rasulu balligh ma unzay ilayka min rabbik. You know, like that consistency, staying uncompromised and how the natural growth happened in, in a very systematic way that Allah had planned. Jen, like, so if, uh, 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 just before Mufti Asim, you know, um, dawns upon that question and answers it. I think what he was talking about earlier, if we can just shed some light, where he said that every person that has Iman is extremely powerful. Mm. If we were to do a quick review of people that stood up at moments of challenges as individuals and the impact that they had, 
we would be surprised in the Quran there are multiple stories of a individual or an individual one person that stood up so you have for example the story of Fir'aun just one person and Allah even uses something like the Nakira Sigha which is like it wasn't like it wasn't someone who was a scholar or a prophet just a person then you have Habib Najjar's story of just one person then if you look at the story of Yusuf that we're going to speak about tonight Musa, Musa written a whole book on it one of the brothers said what La taqtulu Yusuf. That one brother was enough to stop the, the, the murder of a prophet, the son of a prophet. One person. The older brother. One group. The eldest brother. Oh, eldest brother. There was the one group. Yeah. Okay. The, eldest, elder, the eldest brothers are always special. Unique. They're unique. You know? and, so, and there was the one group. Brothers, little, little brothers get bullied. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but Yusuf came back strong, but Jen, you know what I'm saying? So nonetheless... <laughs> Yeah, the one group of people who said, قال, قاموا فقالوا, ربنا رب والأرض. From that vision, what you're saying is, you know, we need to wait and see the effect coming. If you see from these people's stories, they were never actually worried about, and our father, Abu Jiyawa, speaks about this, they were never actually worried about the how. They were worried about the why and the what. What is, what is our job? Why are we doing it? The how was kept in Allah's hands. Sometimes, when we're making decisions for our children, our families, and, and so on and so forth, we're too overwhelmed by trying to understand how is it going to happen. And in some ways, that is trying to confine Allah's abilities. So Allah is the one, amri Allah. Allah is the one that does it. So Musa, in specific, what, what our topic is like, A, like we're one family, one individual. How can we, what is the role of institutions in helping, helping society? What is the role of families? And what is our what is the role of individuals? Because that is society is built from individuals and families and from families to communities and it becomes what it is, right? So it starts back from the individual and then the family and then the institutions and so on and so forth. Now Bajam Sab has moved to Michigan. We want to ask him why he moved here, because and what he believes what the role of institutions I don't, is. I don't, I, don't, I don't think Musab like he has like fully comprehended that he actually moved to America. No, no, Musab, he want, we're gonna speak about that today. He want, he wants to let people know. Or, I mean, we want to ask him why he feels like this is an important move and why we have to continue um, striving, you know, even though it's hard to serve the deen of Allah SWT, whatever capacity we can. So I'll stop I, speaking. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the conversation. Look, let's come back to what the individual has. Individual. To okay. An individual is like we heard from our Mashaikh hundreds and hundreds of times. A person is only can only be in one of two states at any given time in their lives. Either they are inviting towards something or they're being invited oh. towards something. A person is either a da'i or a mad'u. <laughs> so what is when they are, I mean, in an ideal situation, you're always the one that's inviting. Mm. This is the ideal situation. What to do when you're the one being invited? Well, the first thing is, you have to have something of your own that you're inviting to. Hmm. Otherwise, you are completely open for anyone hmm. to convey any message to and be receptive to it. Yeah. So what's my message and how do, I, how do I convey it? It doesn't all have to be about speeches and lectures. We can convey a message. There are people who started, who became very interested in Islam just because they saw a group of Muslims praying hmm. at a gas station. It became a lifelong endeavor for them to study about Islam, just because that one thing had such a powerful impact on them. I've had people have very, very, maybe some other time we'll have a detailed conversation about it, but I've had people very knowledgeable about other religions who were so intrigued just by the way I dressed that it sent them down an entire, like a whole tangent where they, they felt compelled to sit down with me and understand their religion and they did not leave me until they accepted their religion. Mm. What sparked it all? So what are you inviting towards? What are you calling towards? Because if you're not, someone's calling you to something. Mm -hmm. You know, like they say nowadays, it's become very common that if, if they're not selling a product to you, then you are the product that's being sold. Mm -hmm. So 
And this is in the context of social media, how social, social media. media uses uh, its, its users. So um, if we're not inviting towards something, we've already been invited, whether we know it or not, we've already become a part of someone's message. Hmm. Even though our message is the message of Allah, the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuhal nas qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. This is our message. Okay. How did I convey it? Did I convey it? In some way, was I able to convey it? Or was I completely just, just an invitee? Mm. Was I just there to be invited? So everywhere we go, every environment that we go, we should go with our full identity. That's the individual structure. Like this is just the individual. individual. And just by presenting yourself through your Islamic identity, you're telling people in a subtle way that I have something to invite you to. Mm. I have an invitation for you. Some people will come out and just start talking about it. Others will not have the ability to or they won't have the opportunity to, but they're conveying the message that, look, I am inviting towards something. I am calling towards something. I do have a message. If we're not doing that, then we are an open field for anyone's message and everyone's message. So from at the, at the individual level, we need to bring ourselves to that point. Any civilization, any society that has understood that their identity comes first has always passed the test of time. Mm -hmm. They have always prevailed and you'll see them today and they're just as strong. <laughs> any society that felt like it was needy for the identities of other people in order, whether it was under the, uh, the pretense of amalgamation, integration, fitting in, being a part of whatever the, whatever the reason was, mm. those who gave up even a little bit of their identity are very hard to identify today. Gather a crowd. How do you know who is who? What I say is that the first thing somebody should notice about you is your Islam. The moment they set gaze on you, the first thing they should they should know about you, whether they know your name, your your profession, your ethnicity, your language or not, they should know that this is a slave of Allah. This is a Muslim. If we haven't done that, if we haven't managed to even convey that in some way, then what is our invitation? What are we calling towards? And if we're not calling towards anything, then we are open to be called to and invited to Everything. Everything. So let's use that as a starting point. The discussion itself is very long in detail. But let's just say that we decide that I'm not going to give up my identity. I'm not going to give up my faith. I'm not going to give up my uh, the legacy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has imparted to me. In fact, I am going to stay a part of that legacy and I'm going to live as an extension of that legacy. That's my role and function. We're not talking about, you know, big pie in the sky stuff, changing mm. the world and changing, you know, society and changing this and that. No, we're saying let's come back to the grassroots and let's hold firm onto something. <laughs> let's all of us hold firm onto something. And now we now we have something to work with. But if no one's holding on to anything, it's very, it's very difficult to bring a family together, much less a community, much less a society, much less a civilization. And what we have to, for, from, you know, for institutions and for leaders, we have to start seeing Muslims in the West as an entire civilization of humankind, as opposed to just seeing them as, okay, this is my, this is my community, this is my mosque, this is my neighborhood, this is my city, this is, look at the big picture, and understand where is the ummah, what direction are they headed in, what things do they need to be provided, what are the needs of this ummah. And if we have an understanding of that, then it's easy to understand that a, there is a part of all of that in my immediate community. Because mm. my community is just one, it's one unit out of hundreds or thousands of communities. Okay. We, we all have common issues, common problems, you know, common challenges 
and difficulties and sometimes failures and sometimes successes. But the leaders of, of the communities have to have a broader vision and understand what is happening with us as a whole. And that will enable us to, to, uh, to understand what's happening with that brother or that sister that's coming to talk to me in the masjid for a certain issue. There is an issue behind the issue. So as, as community leaders, the responsibility is at a completely different level. And you touched on institutes. Institutes have the power to shape a civilization. If the institutes are strong, if they are, um, if they're very dedicated and they're willing to sacrifice and push through the hard yards, then they have definitely, they have the, uh, the potential to shape a, uh, an entire society. Um, and that is the vision that, that is required in an institute, as opposed to we are here to, um, for example, to offer a facility for mm. prayer, or we are here to um, teach children in this grade to this mm. grade, or we are here to offer this course and that course, or we want to get the youth together. We want to have some youth programs. We want to have some programs for the sisters. There has to be a deeper vision, a bigger vision than that. We're not just getting people together under the, uh, you know, under the banner of Islam mm. or some Islamic activity. That alone is not going to shape it. Gotcha. These are all bits and pieces of a bigger picture, which is how do we as an ummah come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wholeheartedly, completely, Ya kafa. How do we reach that point where everyone wants all of Islam? So the institutes, depending on what type of institute it is, has, um, I think, a very, a very strate strategic role to play. And the greatest effort is the effort on other human beings. The greatest effort. There is no effort greater than, and there is no achievement greater than rectifying, constructing, equipping a human being with knowledge, with akhlaq, mm -hmm. with skills, and sending them out into the world. Mm -hmm. If there was anything nobler, Allah SWT would have given that, that job to the prophets. Mm -hmm. so there's nothing nobler than this. So as institutes, our job is not just to convey information. Our job is to shape individuals because society consists of individuals. So working on them, connecting with them, not just imparting the information, but in imparting to them the essence of the message, the passion and the, the iman that comes with that message and, and the mindset that comes with those teachings. And it doesn't happen in one class or in one course or in one workshop. It takes time. It's gradual. It's, look, there are people... Sheikh Abdullah, you, you, you talked about, you know, slow, you know, slow growth, right? Uh, you know, using some of the, um, some of the statistics from the Prophet Sallallahu own life, that what the first five, six years look like. I'll go a step beyond that. There were people who knew the Prophet Sallallahu from the time of his birth and did not accept Islam until almost the end of his life in this world. Mm. They knew him from birth. Who was Abu Sufyan? Was since birth. He knows the Prophet ﷺ since birth. He's seen him grow up in front of him. He knows everything there is to know about him. And everything happens. No, no, no. He's not only refusing to accept. He is one of the staunchest opponents. Even his own uncle Abbas. Even Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, Safwan ibn Umayyah, I mean, the list goes on. There are so many of those people. So, but did that deter the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It didn't. He kept making dua. He kept making dua and he kept inviting and he kept speaking to those who were receptive. And I think you touched on another point, very good point, uh, that sometimes we get too caught up in the how. And, and we think that the how has to be perfect. You know, the how never was perfect because 
circumstances are unpredictable. The circumstances of the world are not in our control. You start somewhere and you use the guidelines given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book, the guidelines we receive from Rasulullah in the form of his teachings. We work within those guidelines and a path will begin to form. But many times we'll have to forge our own path because the circumstances are different and they're unique. So it's not all about the how. Yeah. Um, it is really about the why and the what. And as long as the how is in line with, with what sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, with what his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has stated in his teachings and set as, as an example, it's all good. But sometimes the how will get really creative. <laughs> you, it's you, fine. Yeah. You could be as creative as you want. As long as it fits in that. You do what you feel is going to be most impactful or in some cases most efficient or in some cases whatever. The how can be worked out. But it's really about the why. Once we find our why and the why will lead us to the what and we work on that, I think we can achieve great things. Jen, wanna, yeah, wanna, wanna add no, some wisdom? There's, there's, no, there's really not much you can add after Mufti Asim Sab. It's, it's just, I, I'm not adding any wisdom, nothing. It's just Mufti Sab. Sometimes people like Mufti Dohab and myself who are trying to do something small and other examples of other people, scholars, institutions out there. And everyone, you know, you know, and Everyone starts to think that they're doing the right thing, you know, and they they get impressed by their institutional growth and what they're doing. But you know, what we lack is mentorship in the institutions, a guidance from people who are older, more senior, to make sure how do we know these institutions are not like derailed? Like what's the checks and balance? How is it that the cause of Islam is the objective? not the person, the name, the fame, or popularity. And that's where prophets constantly had Allah's tarbiyah. All constantly. The Prophet ﷺ had, till his final moment in this world, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving him instructions. You're coming to the end of life. This is what you should do. You know, it wasn't just the beginning. He corrected him at Abasa wa Tawalla, sallallahu alayhi wa and he also instructed him, this is how you end. This is how you complete a great mission that you've done. So there was constant instructions from divine revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And imams, institutions, even parents, sometimes parents think they understand parents. Sometimes scholars think they understand the community. But absolutely, we are constantly in, in need of sharpening our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in with how to do the work. And that's you know mainly why we have a person like you, Mufti Sahib, to be around us. And that is also important. And that's where I sometimes people may start something good, may do something good to impact people's lives. But while doing it, a lot of people, they, they, they get derailed. So that's the strange part. Well, one thing that we, we see consistently throughout the throughout the Islamic scholarship is the need for constant mentorship and um, many of the great uh, people the icons of, of knowledge and of taqwa that we that we look up to they they spent years and years and years with their seniors with their with their teachers, with their shuyukh. It wasn't just, you know, going and just meeting them, but it was spending a significant amount of time. We can give dozens and dozens of examples of this. But that is probably in any field, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we hear we hear a lot about this today, in, you know, in, in, in corporate training seminars, you know, the need for, for a mentor. mentor the need for a guide, the need for someone that you can, you know, you can rely on. This person is not there to control you, but this person is someone that you go back to and, you know, and, and check, check things with, you know, 
let them know what's going on. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing right now. These are the difficulties I'm going through. Am I thinking the right things? Am I taking the right steps? Is my decision-making process correct or do I need to fix it? Um, this is what my routine looks like. This is what my schedule looks like. Is this okay? Um, these are the plans I have. So to have someone, uh, you know, mentoring us is, is really, it's one of the biggest blessings. And honestly, you know, sometimes the, the gravity of that only settles in when the mentor is gone. When you realize what a massive, massive gap and void they have left in your life. And, um, you know, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very difficult thing to, to grapple with. It's a very, very difficult thing that who do I go to now uh, to deal with this? And then one can, you know, sort of imagine in, at a very minuscule level, what must have been the void in the hearts of Sahaba when the Prophet left this world? Um, like what level of grief they must have gone through? Allahu Akbar. So, um, if we if somebody has someone like that, it's a boon, it's a gift from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If somebody doesn't, they should actively seek out someone that they that they feel they can relate to, they feel that they can they can benefit from, on the terms of the other person, obviously. It's not like it's something that's on demand. It's mm. never on demand. Uh, it's never, you know, I'm here, so I'm here. You know, I'm here, so <laughs> give up everything, leave, drop what you're doing. You know, I'm important. It, it's it's not like that. Um, you know, uh, but it's I think it's a necessary part of growth. Without it, we can't really grow. Um, and without it, sometimes we just become a legend in our own mind. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. And, and the, the, the opportunities of growth and self-correction are, are, are greatly diminished. Mufti usually, Mufti Duhar, you want to say something about mentorship? You want to say something? No, no, I think I, I think Mufti Duhar spoke about it. Sure. Yeah, I was just yeah, saying, yeah. I, would be, I would be a great mentor, you know, like overall, like my, my ability to mentor people, especially rich people. I mentor yeah. rich, my, my best moneys are rich people. <laughs> you mentor their finances. I mentor their finances. They, they always ask me, where should I give charity? I say, Mufti <laughs> You know, and they like that, and I, I mentor them pretty well. And he thinks he thinks he thinks he thinks that <laughs> it's, just, uh, it's something with the, you know wealthy people that get along with me very well. So do I, and I'm just joking. I know I'm, I, you know, you know, they're, they're, we were all in de- we're all dependent on on guidance. I just that was just a lighthearted statement. That's not the truth, um, and uh, and we as students of knowledge and as you know instructors in this seminary we find that um mufti asim sab you you keep on talking about your your teachers like your seniors like it's like constant you know like it and and you did a translation of Mulana yusuf mutara rahmatullahi's book itaat rasul and then you got to see like the way his teachers talked about his mentors and um how influence that how influential that was and and how it, that being around a mentor like Mona Yusuf Rahmatullah, it kind of like he brought his 40 years, 50 years of his experience of his life as a scholar, as a developer of one of the greatest institutions in the Western world. And he kind of gave you that. He's he put it into an, in a really beautiful way in front of your eyes. And he broadened your horizon. You already were mashallah Mufti Sahib, amazing personality. But it, it is it is unique that even who you are, that you still traveled across, you know, the ocean multiple times to spend Ramadan with him, host him, go with him to Trinidad, have him visit you in Vancouver, go to England and spend Etikaf, like which is like the last ten nights or the whole Ramadan with him. This is unbelievable. Like a a, a child, a, a young man. Or a young woman cannot spend after a certain age extensive time with their own parents. I gotta go, I got things to do, I got a wife, I got children. 
to like dedicate all this for your teacher, your mentor, you know, and you've had multiple and you saw value in that. And it wasn't because you were going to gain some worldly popularity. Like most of the people don't even know the time that you spent with all these mashaykh, you know? But I think you, found, I don't think, I believe you found some extreme self-value, like your own personal value in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it, it uplifted you. And that's that's something that we don't hear from you. If you can just, if you don't, Mufti Doha, if you don't mind, like, can you share? I know you're a very private person. You don't share much about your personal life. But if you could, me, I, I tell everybody everything about my life. You know, what's going on, you know, my, 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 you know I, I, I sometimes I'll screen, I'll share the screen about my finances and accounts, you know? Just show your needs. Yeah, you know, show my needs. <laughs> But the reality we, have big, we do have a banquet coming up soon. But but Jen, before that, like before Musab speaks about that, but I'm sure someone's sitting there watching, or where however they're listening or watching, thinking, well, we're not scholars, we're not students of knowledge. Mm. Um, what definition and this is not Christianity either, where there's a concept mm. of confessions, right? Like where, mm. where so where is the idea of what do, what what do I need in a mentor? And Mufsab, of course, and correct us if we're wrong, but it can even be a parent, right? Father or mother, a elder sibling, uh, someone in our community that is able to guide us. And I know Imam Abaziz, when he was applying for uh, his residency and mashallah, was doing all the great things he was doing. I mean, he was speaking to people that I don't think he would speak to for the sake of asking them what car to buy. He was asking them what program to 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 uh, you know, uh, admit with himself into or yeah. what, what apply. Program? So like it, it was more so it was. Very specific. It was niche based, and I don't think anyone should feel any form of uh, uh, like I was used. No, if people are able to seek advice from us, and we're able to help them in a niche, help them in a certain area, and be a mentor, we shouldn't feel like oh, and they left and never came back to us. So what? So what? Yeah. Yusuf yeah. Salam got used by by the person who saw the dream. He didn't feel like he did, whatever. It's okay. Yeah, that was the same yeah. thing that he got used. But it was the reason why he got out of jail. No, right? he, said, so like, he did say it was Kurni and the Rabbik for Ansahu Shaitan. Yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, like when he came back, he didn't say to him, uh, you know, like it's been like seven years. No, it's okay. Like it's it's, it's all right, it's all cool. Like, yeah. why do we get offended when someone remembers us at the time of need but doesn't think of us for it's okay, it's a part of the process of life, right? Uh, but it's niche, like so Musab, how do we normal youngsters, families, even a father or mother, uh, they're thinking about where to move, what to do with their children. Like, it's not that easy to find a mentor either. Like, what, so, happened, what, what are happened, we looking for? So what happened uh -huh. to my question? You, you, you completely... No, no, no. First, we can answer that. First, we can answer that, Bishan. I think I think, I think uh, simple answer to your question, just send them all to Shaykh Abdullah. Okay, that's true. Because yeah. he is the self-proclaimed mentor. Mentor. But <laughs> just ask them to check no, their finances no, before no. they reach out to him. Because, because that'll be one of the first questions. <laughs> so what are you doing nowadays? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think there's 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 the Gustahi Muftisab. Toys the Gustahi Hogi is me. You know, there's more than the the, the Messiah. Sorry, Messiah. You can answer that one later. But first, you can answer his question. If you feel comfortable. Look, how about your elders and spent the time you spent. Well, I'll just <laughs> tell you that I didn't just believe that it was beneficial. I believe that there was no other way to mm. do what I need to do. Oh, wow. Wow. There was there there never was an option wow. for this. If there would have been an option, Sahaba would have found it, the Tabi'is would have found it, Atba Tabi'in would have found it, someone would have found it. There never has been another way. You always go to your elders in Deen to learn about Deen and to learn about how to do the work of Deen. There is no other way. So to me. I was compelled from inside to do this. Like, I was so restless to do this. I can't describe it. Muftisab, yeah. can, can I make a confession? You know, in in in, in, in December, I, when we, and I met you in Medina, Munawwara, we sat, I sat with Mufti Asim Saab. This is way before Mufti Asim Saab even thought about moving to Michigan. And then after Tahajjud and Fajr, then he took me to the hotel. We sat in the lobby. You shared unbelievable personal experiences with your mashayikh. Mufti Sahib, I, you, you will never share it publicly, for sure, I know. Without your permission, I did record it. And time after time, I, I listen. <laughs> I, I, I do listen to it. It's such a no such thing as, 
you know, I, I, no, I, I did record it and I benefited so much. And I was like, I think I was telling my students, my, my group that came from Michigan, Flint, I enjoyed Medina and the Barakah of Medina. It was unbelievable. But spending that hour, two or three hours with you was unbelievable. It, gets, it just, you took me into another uh, realm of scholars and pious people, you know? So yeah. that's why I was kind of like, I'm really eager to hear, hear you say something about your mentors and what you just said was amazing how you like there was no survival without being without being, being there's no survival without them sorry about that Mufti Zabai cut you off look my my advice to the you know to all the brothers and sisters to the masses to the average mm. you know person who's out there is start reading about the lives of the pious people of this ummah oh, subhanallah I mean, read the lives of Sahaba. Mm. For some people, the lives of Sahaba are are not so easy to understand because they can't relate to that time. They can't relate to those circumstances. There's many things that they don't understand. And uh, so it's okay. Start with people of, a, people of a later time, people of a later time, people of later time. Start with people of, you know, very of the re very recent past. You can, they can read my life. But do no, you're still alive. They, they, ideally, they should have left this world. I do. <laughs> so, there are always exceptions. Mustafna. <laughs> <laughs> and and read about how they became what they became. Oh. You know, as the Sheikh Muhammad Zakaria Sawarhatullah used to say that those who saw our beginning succeeded, and those who saw our end failed. The beginning were the days of struggle, the days of you know endless nights of uh, of studying of mujahada uh, very very simple or or very few means and it was just endless struggle mm. and it was a very very hard lifestyle very tough lifestyle that was taken on most of it was you know by choice my choice he said those who saw that and understood it, those people succeeded because they understood what it really takes. And those who saw my end, meaning after I'm a sheikh, I'm renowned, like Sheikh Abdullah is, you know, the whole world knows him. Mm. Everyone, you know, comes to meet him and sends their greetings to him. You know, those who saw my end after my, you know, after all of this, constantly people around me, constantly people coming to see me, great leaders of countries, taking out time and try just to, you know, get to make Musafa. Those who saw this were ruined. They were failed because they thought that this is what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. It's all about the beginning of the journey. Allah. So, um, read about the, read about, read about the pious people. Read is, about, and I'll, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Because the straight path, that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in every mm -hmm. raka'ah of every salah, as sirat al-mustaqeem, it's a path that's identified by people. Yep. It's not a path that's identified by concepts. Mm. You don't find your way to that path by understanding concepts. You find that path by following certain people. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say sirat al-a'mal al-fulaniyya. Mm. Sirat al-iman wa taqwa mm. Sirat al-tawheed. No, he says, Sirat al an'amta alayhim. Wow. It's the path of those people. Oh Allah, put me on the path of those people that you favored. And those people Allah has favored, He has told us who those people are. Hmm. And nabiyin as siddiqeen as shuhada as salihin Read about these four categories of people, you will find the right path and you'll stay there. Wow. Because you'll know how it's done. Wow. Because it's done by people. And if you're walking on a path and you don't see these people anywhere on that path, it means you're on the wrong path. <laughs> So and if you're walking on a path and you see them, these are the signboards. These are the milestones. These are the indicators. So you're there. This is the GPS. This wow. is the navigation system. That I'm on the right path. I'm on the right. I'm on the right route. Otherwise, we're just not. Well, this so that's can, you, well, can you please have to, uh, take your permission because we do have another program in about a few minutes, yeah. thirteen minutes. You know, Muftah, but can you recommend like a book uh, quickly, like two in two minutes, a few books? It depends on the reader. If if the reader is very well versed in Arabic, I would suggest reading something like Sir Alam and Nubala, uh, Imam al-Zahabi, There are simplified versions of that. 
read the books of uh, read any of the books of Rijal and Tabaqat. All of those are good. The subhanat, something simple for the awam. For, for for the English reader, you know. Read read, read our legends. Read Hayat al Sahaba in English. Read the lives of whichever pious people um, have been written about in English that you can read. Find those books and read them. There, there are many, many books that are coming out. I don't usually follow a lot of the English uh, writings because there's a lot of stuff that's coming out. Mm. I don't personally read those types of books in English myself. But um, what I w- would suggest is that the listeners and the viewers, they go and look. And then if, if you want to verify, then ask the scholars here at Miftah, ask them if these are books that they would recommend and then let them, let them recommend them for you. Mufti Dohab, you wrote a book on pious people, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you looked at some resources. Can you share some of the resources that you recommend, at least in English? I mean, I simplified it. Just read the book. Start with that. We can start with Legend. Legends is our a book. Legends, yeah, you know, it is. Our, our Legends? I mean, uh, our Legends is a good I mean, I think, I mean, it's not like... It's, it's it's I, 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 I benefited from it, honestly. It's a, it's, it's a compilation of 10 individuals, 10 personalities that, because everyone's personality, you know, connects with different people. Um, these ten people are quite different in certain ways. So depending on you know how uh, who you connect with, how you connect, you will definitely connect with one of the individuals and personalities. And inshallah, if Allah allows us, we'll be adding more people in this list because the list is it's a yes. never-ending list. But there is a book that 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 that, 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 that book itself takes from a lot of different books, um, mostly in Arabic. Um, and some of them even in Urdu, but that'll be a good start. Inshallah. Saviors of the Islamic Spirit is, is a translation of uh, Rijal al Fikri wa Da'wa and uh, in Arabic and Tarikh al Da'wa to Azimut al Urdu. Saviors of the Islamic Spirit is, um, is a wonderful book. It covers a wide span of personalities across history. It talks about, you know, it talks about uh, their lives in a, in, in a great deal of uh, depth and detail. That's a book that I can recommend. Um, but the idea is to put people on that path so they start connecting with those who will take them onto the straight path. Mufti Sab, Mufti Dohab, are you guys in a hurry? When, they, when you guys want to wrap up, can I ask some quick um, rapid fire questions to Mufti Asim? Rapid fire means yeah, rapid fire, not like. Yeah, Mufti Asim Sab, you, you, you answer them quickly and we'll let you go. But we have, I have a few questions uh, and I'd like the audience to know personally. And Mufti Dohab brought it up in the middle of the session. So what time do you guys have to leave? In 10 minutes? In five minutes. Okay, move this up. So, um, why did you move to Michigan? You should know the answer to that. No, I think I think the public wants to know. Just just for well, since we're saying this in public, these guys made me do it. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had no intention whatsoever. <laughs> I thought you were never going to tell the public we forced you. <laughs> I was coerced into this. Please help me. <laughs> Take me back. I'm being held against my will. <laughs> and, it's yeah. the only, and it's the only person we do that with. You know, there's something Mufti Asim said, I'm never going to move to the United States of America. And I said, Mufti Sab, never say never. Allah SWT has written your disk here. You're going to come. And uh, Mufti Sab, so beyond us forcing you to move here, what other what other things? Oh. You, you had so many options anywhere in the world. You came from Australia. So you were... All the way across the Atlantic, in in a no man land, Australia. Pacific or Atlantic? Which one? The Pacific. Pacific. Oh, Pacific sorry. Right. Across Pacific. Yeah. I don't think yeah. geography. No, is. Of all the things. Yeah. Sorry. Can, it depends if I go. It depends if I take. Look at the blue light. He's completely disoriented. I don't, I don't know it either. That's why. I was actually, no, 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 no. Of course, we, we took the California flight. It was over the Pacific, but when you go over Etihad and. Come back that yeah, way. Oh boy. See, look where you took them. It's just all around the world. Yeah, if you take the oh. the, the, the Qantas airline, what's that? Yeah, Ghetto Qantas. airline. You guys, <laughs> look, I don't know who came up with that service there. Is that the national service of Australia? Qantas? Uh, it's not. Well, they have a kangaroo for their uh, logo. So, so it has something to do with it. For <laughs> so sure. you figure it out. I was so <laughs> disappointed the service there. But, but, this up. So what brought you to um, Michigan? <laughs> Our mandate is to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, within the three prophetic objectives given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which are da'wa yatlu alihim ayatihi, wa yuzakihim, which is rectification, purification, and correction of the individual, improvement of the individual, and wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmah. So 
within these <clears throat> within these uh, lines of work, we have tried to keep ourselves occupied throughout our lives, um, especially in the line of teaching and learning, in the line of you know self improvement and islah. And um, what you brothers are doing is, uh, alhamdulillah, it's significant. You have been uh, asking me for many many years to um, you know to be a part of it, and even before that, you uh, may Allah reward you. You've been taking guidance, asking advice. Uh, probably every step of the way. And, uh, you know, it, it, it makes me very happy to see the work that all of you are doing. It's, it's, it's significant work. I think you're headed in the right direction. Like you, like you keep saying to me that you need direction, you need, um, you need mentorship. Um, you know, whatever I have gained from my, from my elders, I'm happy to share that. Um, it's there for sharing. It's not for the sake of keeping to myself. And the people that are the most deserving of it are those who are most eager for it. Mm -hmm. They are the most deserving. And so you guys are in the field and there's a lot that can be done. Alhamdulillah, a platform has been created. A, uh, an effort has been made. Um, you know, significant amount of groundwork has been laid. And now it's time to take this thing forward. And, you know, if, if I can contribute to that, then... You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it and take work from us. We have, uh, you know, between ourselves, we have many, many goals as to the level of education, the next offering, the next level of education, expanding the types of education, expanding the reach of that education, and then really working on individuals so that we leave behind an entire generation of Muslims that are ready to take their religion and take it to the next level. That's really what it's all about. Yeah, inshallah. So, uh, that was a Perfect. I mean, a great answer. But if the next question is, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep them personal, like nothing religious related. Um, so how has your transition been to moving to Michigan? Like as the city, the state, the weather, how it like quickly? Are you enjoying it or you still have some um, situation? Well, alhamdulillah, the weather has been very nice. So the, the weather has been the weather has been pleasant. The transition is very complicated. There are many, many moving parts. Mm -hmm. Um of course, at the top of did my we, list. Did we, did we make it complicated or was it just complicated? Until... I, won't, I won't speak. No comment. This moment. Three the fifth. <laughs> quick quick, quick no, question. All, the... have, have, all of you have done whatever is in your capacity to help out. And it's, and it's, uh, it's noted and appreciated. No, at the top of the list of concerns is uh, my mother, who for whom I actually came back to North America. So to get her set up and to make sure that she's looked after. Um, that's really what we're, uh, what I'm working on right now. But alhamdulillah, the transition has been okay. It's been complicated. It hasn't been without, uh, oh. you know, without challenges. But you know, I guess uh, that's just a part of it. But, I know you uh, all of these uh, brothers and sisters that are here, I'm going to request them for dua that mm -hmm. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes it easy and accepts it from us, and uh, paves this path path for us, mm -hmm. so that all of the difficulties and complications are removed by His grace and mercy, mm -hmm. and this becomes a source of good for us and for all of you. Um, you guys gotta go. Inshallah. Zakallah khair, everyone, for joining our session. We'll see you all next Friday, inshallah. Sound to Rika. Zakallah khair, Mufsad. Assalamu alaikum. Um, sound guys, you know that's perfect. It's just me and you guys. I was, I, you know, I couldn't speak freely in front of my teacher, and of course, Mufsad don't have. He didn't even say much. He was so nervous sitting next to Mufti Asim Sab, and he should be. You know, um, it is it is uh, is an honor to have him on with us in a live session. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Just as a closing, a few closing remarks. Honestly, um, he we, we we touched on a few points, and one of was the mentorship aspect of it. And uh, honest, we have I have brother, my all of our brothers have been eager and thirsty to have um, having an uh, an elder, a teacher, working with us, helping us, guiding us throughout the process. And as we have we've grown in our stages in our life as a as a spouse, as a parent, as a teacher, as an instructor, as a part of institution, we, we felt like part of our, you know, you know, type of work that we're doing was draining us emotionally, physically, and spiritually too. It should be like opposite. We're like, we're, when we're teaching so much and then it's like, Alhamdulillah, you're elevated. But sometimes in the process, you get so drained emotionally and, and also spiritually. Uh, and we needed to find, and we were eager to have someone um, close to us, and we were communicating with Mufti Asim Sab in distance. Like phone calls, he would visit us every single year, two times. He would visit us for five days, five days, 
and we would go over um, some of the things that we uh, were doing, and he would give us insight in it. But um, having him move back, move move to Detroit with us, being at Niftah and MII, which is Michigan Islamic Institute at the boarding school, and seeing him day in and day out, being a teacher, teaching with him, and then seeing him between the classes is extremely valuable to me. As I don't care how valuable it is to the students, honestly. It is extremely valuable to me, and I'm sure it's valuable to the students in the institution and in general. And we are quite, we are limiting his exposure for a few reasons. Number one, he's still moving. And number two, the immediate exposure is local in Michigan to the students that he's um, serving at the, at the Islamic boarding school and also at Miftah. And uh, we don't want to overwhelm him. He does travel once a month to different states. He was in Boston. He's in uh, um, and, in Seattle. So Mufti Asim Saab and I, exactly what I was envisioning. You know, like I wish for the institution to grow, but I do not want it to grow on hollow on hollow souls. Like, like I'm gonna say that again. Like it's great that Mufti is growing. Uh, millions of people are viewing it. Thousands of people are attending the events, but I, I would really, it would be devastating that all this is growing on hollow souls and it needs to have extreme delicate attention. What we're doing, if it's right, if it's wrong, if it's done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what a great feeling to have. People love it when people compliment them. I love it. Who doesn't love it? But it's such a great feeling to have someone guide you and correct you and then elevate you. And that's definitely uh, our teacher here that was with us with the Asim Sab. And uh, <sighs> I don't like to do this, but I am. You know, a few years ago, I was speaking to a few scholars uh, from Qalam Institute. And we were just speaking about our needs and challenges at institutional level. And uh, one of the scholars there asked me, so what is like, what is the most challenging thing? And I said, it's not money, it's not audience, it's not a curriculum, it's not students. I said, the challenge is, is that us, we need someone for ourselves, right? We need someone for our own mentorship and we need someone to take us and, you know, and, you know, and I would complain to my dad about this all the time all the time. I used to say that we are orphans when it comes to spiritual growth. When I mean it, and I mean it, I'm not even making this up. We are orphans when it comes to spiritual growth. People complimenting you, uh, people praising you, and of course, keep on praising whoever you like. There's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, and uh, we were praised of other scholars, having scholars around them, guiding them, protecting them. So we would. So my dad said something really interesting. He said, Deko, if you don't have someone to guide you and help you, Allah will be your direct murabbi. He will, he will give you whatever attention you need if you don't have someone. Just like how an orphan, biological orphan child, doesn't have a biological parent, still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them what they need to succeed in this world. And sometimes that orphan becomes more successful than someone who had parents to guide them. So he said that, and he said the example of Musa alayhi salam. He said he was raised in the palace of Fir'aun and he became Kalimullah. So Allah is the, the, the murabbi, and if you complain to Allah, he will guide you. And of course, I believed in it, I still believe in it. And, uh, you know, and eventually this was the uh, uh, this was the um, this is an interesting question. Couldn't couldn't your spouse be your guidance too? I'm gonna get to that in a second. Let me finish my thought. Um, so uh, eventually, I asked the sheikh that was talking to me from one of the instructors at Qalam, and he said, "No, Abdullah, what you will have to do is you're gonna have to beg God. You're gonna have to go to the Kaaba. You're gonna have to talk to Allah." You're going to have to go to the, the door of the Kaaba. You're going to have to go to the Multazim, which is next to the door of the Kaaba. You're going to have to Hajj al Aswad. You're going to go and have to Hajj al Ismail. You're going to have to go to Maqam Ibrahim. You're going to have to make Dua in Tawaf. You're going to have to go to the Rawda. You're going to have to go in Arafah. You're going to go to Safa Marwa. 
all the locations in Makkah and Medina which are mustajab dua which are promised where duas are accepted. You're going to have to go to all these places and beg Allah like a child. And hopefully, he will answer your dua. So when Mufti Asim Saab was in the discussion, a lot of people were like, very, even us were very skeptical. Like, you think he's going to move from Australia. He has his mother in Alberta. He has his family in Vancouver. And he has an offer from the Parliament of Canada in Ottawa. You know? So we're like, chances are very little. And uh, we made our du'as. And when my brother started talking about this, I said, it's going to happen. And I was 100% guaranteed, assured it's going to happen. Visa was the, the biggest complex. Can you get the visa for a Canadian? Alhamdulillah. Of course, he got his visa. He's legal. His family is legal. He is Canadian citizen. So everything can work out. Housing, uh, opportunity, job, structure, students. If you don't have visa, you're not legal, you can't, you can't be a teacher here. So I told my brothers, I think it's going to happen. And I didn't tell them why. Because it's when you make dua and you trust Allah, Allah answers them. It's not a joke. And the dua was sincere and we really needed something for our own self, for our growth. And um, I'm very satisfied. Honestly, I've in my life at this point to know there's someone around me who I can meet is very satisfying. It's it's so valuable to my to myself and my brothers and everyone around. So inshallah, you know, in, in the relationship is unique also. It's you know, he is a teacher, but he's also a friend. And it should be like that, you know, like in that was that's prophetic. I have students who I am their teachers. And now I'm also their friend. You know, it's it's just it's just this is beautiful. It's all from the Prophet Sallallahu teachings. There's no there's there's respect, but also love. And so um so somebody asked, Can't your wife, couldn't your spouse be your guidance too? Um and I like this question. It's yeah, so if you don't find a mentor in life, which most people don't, this is the answer. Your your spouse, especially your wife. She will fix you, correct you, and if you listen, you become a friend of God. Or God help your marriage. So that's my answer to this situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, protect us and uh, make us people of true uh, value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give us an environment where we can protect ourselves and our families. Give us mentors that can guide us in every step of our life. Everyone, have a great night. Take care. Inshallah, we'll see you guys next Friday night live. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Take care.